Okay, we're ready to ready to start. So let me uh, our next our next presenter, um, artist has one of the most fascinating titles that I've seen. He's going to talk to us about how to understand our Wi-Fi brains and learn how to learn in a collective and digital world. So um, I'm anxious to learn about my Wi-Fi brain. So let me turn it over to artist. So let's welcome artist. Thank you. And can we actually say thanks to all the crew here, the video, the 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 Reggie and uh, and David, they deserve their uploads too, I think, because they're working hard as well. Thank you, guys. All right, so you heard the title, uh, Wi-Fi Brains and How to Learn, How to Learn. Any questions or anything that comes to your mind that you would like to absolutely cover before I start? Just raise your hand and shoot out a word or anything. Yes. Artists, can you... Uh, when, as you go through your talk, can you give us some very real examples of how this would apply to improving our training? Sure. Just real examples. Real right? examples. Real examples. All right. Yes. Anything else we want to cover? Anything that comes to your mind? Yes. Here. Yeah? One advice to learn quickly. So real examples and advice to learn quickly. So hopefully we <laughs> will go through at least those points and. Feel free to jump in if anything very important comes to your mind, of course. So one thing that, one question actually that also I would like to ask uh, during this talk is what could be the difference between an empowered team that actually learns, that is very powerful at learning, and an induction plate like some of you may have at home? So this is also a third question that I suggest we explore today together. So that first team, empowered team for me, was when I was a young primary school student in uh, Abidjan in Ivory Coast, where I lived for a couple of years. So imagine Abidjan, it's uh, 40 degrees Celsius with 90% humidity, very cool weather. And uh, my parents, my sister and I, we had a, a big house it was cool with air conditioning and everything. It was really a great life. And I remember, so this is me here, yes, in this picture. I remember one night I was, I'm in my room. I was uh, deeply asleep. Uh, you have to imagine there's this AC air conditioning uh, that's making a lot of noise and I have anti-mosquito around my bed, etc. I'm deeply asleep. It's about 3 a.m. And suddenly I wake up. I don't know really why. I step out of my bed, I walk to my parents' room, and there I find my mother having an epileptic crisis. So for those who know what is epilepsy, it's a very strong electrical crisis in the brain, and I find my, my mother like totally agitated. It really feels like she's just dying, basically, so it's pretty impressive. I sit by her bed and just wait for seconds that uh, felt like years, but the crisis finally passed and everything goes back to normal and everything is happy. But still, I ask myself, how is it possible that although our room's house is big, it's 50 meters away at least, there's a lot of noise in the room, I'm deeply asleep, how can I feel this happening although there's no noise? How is that possible? And actually, while at school, a few years later, I hear that or I learned that when an electrical current goes through an electrical wire, it creates an electromagnetic field. And what, when that electromagnetic field hits another wire, it creates current in that wire. And so there is a connection between two wires, and that's called electromagnetic induction. And that's simply how this works. Actually, the same principle, your induction plate, for those who have them, that's how they work. Also, contactless payments, you know, when you use your credit cards, contactless, same principle. You transmit information, although there is no contact. And so I asked myself, maybe there was some kind of Wi-Fi connection between my mother and I, and that actually my brain changed its electrical activity through contactless connection with what was happening in my mother's uh, brain. I don't have a clear answer to this. I know there was something happening. At least science doesn't give clear answers on this, but that's my belief that we may 
have Wi-Fi connection between our brains, just like your induction plate. Still, what happened is that with this experience, it led me to want to learn more on how our brain and how our nervous system works in general, in real life. And so I learned three things um, throughout the years that I want to share with you, which I felt were very important. The first one is that we understand that our ability to learn or our brain activity, our nervous activity or our ability to learn is not only about electrical signals as we may believe, it's also a lot about chemical signals, hormones, neurotransmitters. And what is interesting is to understand that those effects, those uh, emotions that you feel in your body have a lasting life of 90 seconds. So every time, for instance, you feel fear entering a meeting, preparing for a big client presentation, or just running a project, entering a room, anything, anything where you need to be in full control of yourself and to learn maybe also, that feeling you have, you know, that, that little stress you have is the effect of those chemical hormones going through your bloodstream. And it takes 90 seconds, 90 seconds, that's one minute and 30 seconds for the blood to evacuate those particles out of your body. Beyond that time, it's only you, your mind, your dream, creating this feeling. So this feeling, uh, this, this, or this ability maybe to learn, or this state in which you are, which may actually hinder you from learning, only really lasts 90 seconds. If it's more than 90 seconds, it's you creating that. It's not reality. That is, I think, a very important tip that I use myself daily. Whenever you want to learn or you want to give an organization its ability to learn, understand that the physical process only lasts 90 seconds. Then it's created by your mind. There is no external factor. Or you are creating it yourself. So maybe for yourself, for your team, for whoever you want to drive learning, how do you help them not have that break for more than 90 seconds if there is fear, if there is blockage? The second thing I learned that struck me in our ability to learn is that we often say that our brain is fixed after teenagehood. That's it, you got a brain, you got your ability to learn or you got your talents fixed. Reality says that actually it's called neuroplasticity. Our brain are more like modeling clay and that you can change it until you die. That your brain or every your ability to learn can change and is there all your life. And so the question is how do I actually use that natural ability to continue learning and to continue create new connection. In practice, what it means, this modeling clay image, is that I can create new connections in my mind all my life, right? I can create those all my life. I can even change my brain structure so I can change my habits, how I perceive emotions, how I am with people all my life. It requires some effort, but it's possible when maybe 20 or 30 years ago, we didn't think it was possible. We thought you're 18 years old, that's it, done. You're done. Your, your, um, your abilities are fixed. That's not true. The last thing I learned, which, was, which I found very interesting, is that most 95% of our behavior are automatic. So my ability to learn, my ability to learn is automatic. What I'm trying to say is just like, remember when I drive, uh, when I learn how to drive a car at first, for those who drive cars, it takes me a lot of time to uh, press uh, the right pedal and then to drive the gear and then turn, you know, it, it takes effort. And then after some time while I drive my car, it becomes 
automatic, right? I don't think about what I'm doing, I'm still driving my car, or if I even I, I cycle, same. The way our nervous system works, so the way also our ability to learn works, is the same. It's automatic, it's, or it's habits. Now what's powerful is, if you remember about the neuroplasticity we thought about uh, before, you may today, in your company, yourself, or your team, you may not have that habit of learning, but you can create it. But what's, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that understand that the habits that you have in your team are automatic and that they are unconscious. Most of them are unconscious. And most of those automatism are driven by a small part of the brain, which is, uh, I would say, really the animal part of our brain that's called striatum and that striatum is mainly driven by four motivators which is access to food sexuality access to information power all those because those are the most effective factors to survive so what i'm trying to tell you is that most of your behavior today that you probably are unconscious of and that includes myself are driven by those four factors. Food, sexuality, need for information, need for power. Now, the, the importance about neuroplasticity is that you can change how you use those habits. You can change those habits and you can become aware of them and you can also go beyond those um, auto automatism to drive your ability to learn. The entire point I'm trying to make with all those uh, factors is just saying that first we can change your, uh, our brains and we can change our ability to learn. Second, it does require some effort, but those efforts are worth investing because once you use those efforts regularly, it, they become automatic. Average time, 21 days. That's what it said in general. You, it requires about repeating those new habits once a day for a month, say so that it becomes automatic. So I'm not just trying to give a hope message, I'm just trying to give you some pragmatic factors that explain why you, you can, but you need, it requires effort. And that's what I learned from being interested in neuroscience. So what an example is, I'm actually gonna go to, to an example. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to that, but thanks for your question. One factor that is very important, uh, what is the first factor, how do I do that? First factor, I will tell another story. A uh, couple of years after Africa, I was in China. That was uh, when I was at Airbus, five years, like uh, an entrepreneur, if you want. We started Airbus operations in China. And uh, I walked down the street in Tianjin, which is city south of Beijing, for those who know uh, China a little bit. And I asked directions for a shop in Chinese, because I do speak Chinese. And uh, some people tell me, well, it's this way, so I follow, I get there, but I found that it's, the shop is not at all there, it's the opposite. And so that, this situation happened several times, and I thought those people in Tianjin, they're not very nice to me. I speak in Chinese, and they give me wrong directions. But then I learned that there's, there was a cultural trait that that says that if someone doesn't know exactly where it is, it doesn't, doesn't feel good to say no or I don't know. There's a cultural trait in France, in Paris, someone tells me somewhere and I don't know, I'll just say I don't know. But there, it's, it's not so good to, to have that behavior. But once I learned this, I thought actually, even if I know uh, how to speak Chinese fluently or I know all of China's history, I don't understand China. The only way I can understand China is accept that the notion of politeness, the notion of politeness might be totally different from what I expected. In my world, even living in Africa, uh, in the Philippines with my parents when I was younger as well, I thought politeness was about you know, helping someone maybe in a, in a short, but maybe there, it, there's a different notion. The day I accept there, is, there might be in the world a different way of seeing that, then maybe I understand what it is, China. The reason I'm telling you this story is just to say that the first factor on how to learn or to be able to learn in my team on myself, I need to accept the, the possibility of having different point of views, of having different
different way of seeing the world that has that may be as fundamental as politeness the just the no, what do you mean by being polite who knows the day you do this um, I think that can help you actually drive the ability to learn for yourself but for others within your team the second thing on the how and to your point uh, about uh, how do we create those new habits you remember we talked about this question what is the difference between this induction plate and a team that learns how to learn it's also about the frame you give create those new habits is first accepting you remember this accepting and second the frame this induction plate you see the chocolate here it doesn't work if it's not on the right frame it needs the right plate that's an induction um, pan I mean sorry induction pan but you also need the right induction plate so it's it, making this nice chocolate here is both about the chocolate itself you need to have nice chocolate but also the frame in which you place this chocolate is important same for you so you remember accepting is the first and the frame what do I mean by the frame to create the right habits or to give you an example is in a team meeting how do I run my team a meeting a project or even my entire organization my startup or my company those are the three factors that I apply myself with my clients or with myself which I think are, are important first my posture as facilitator I'm not here to give answers even if I'm the CEO the founder or the chief of the world whatever you call it I'm here to help others find their answers that's my posture remember about acceptance I can accept others sees politeness differently I take a new posture that is very hard I can assure you it is hard I mean it takes time but very important I'm a facilitator second I set norms set norms mean I set psychological safety so people feel safe to learn to listen to others what I do with my own meetings I set three norms which I call the three S's uh, express yourself with sincerity uh, right uh, be authentic second si um, listening to each other and third silence as in phone in silence and then I ask the team if they are okay with those norms or if they want to change it the simple fact of setting norms meaning we together we talked about norms makes the group feel safe to express what they really feel and to listen and then to learn that has a direct effect on their ability to learn norms third share roles share roles an example is having uh, I take the role of facilitator for instance and I ask for two volunteers to be observers those observers at the end of the meeting they take one minute to share how they felt or what marked them during the meeting when I do this I put I give the team the ability to step back from what they saw and I have people that are assigned to that role so I create the frame the team's ability to learn this neuroplasticity that we talked about if the team is not uh, working daily to create the habit or if people didn't hear about what we taught the 90 seconds rule it doesn't matter if I put if I do those three the effect will be the same so I may have people that are were not sitting here in the room with you they will still have the same effect if I do those three and the power of those three rules is they work both in person but also digital if I'm on a Skype or whatever you use and I want to make sure this those people around the table digital they learn I do the same I take a role as facilitator I assign other roles could be someone that writes down the synthesis of what we said someone that steps back whatever you come with and I set norms so this work in both digital and in person and it works for you running a project a 30 minutes meeting or running your entire organization So the, the point you remember is I don't know actually if our brain works like Wi-Fi, although I have a strong belief there is something like this happening. The only thing I'm sure is that 
the ability to learn is both dependent on the chocolate yourself, right? But also the frame you set for yourself or for your team, your company, your project. Those are the two points that are important. And, uh, well, if you want to, uh, you know, talk more about this, I'll be happy to go and test some chocolate uh, milk with you somewhere in Paris. Uh, you can just book a meeting on this address here or just uh, give me a call and thank you. Right. If any further questions or things I didn't cover, please. Yeah, thank you so much. There is time for a couple of questions. Um, here. Uh, you mentioned 21 days for uh, embedding a habit. So I learn, I uh, read about it, but I've never seen a scientific reference uh, on who, uh, who, what is the uh, science behind. So I'm going to be honest, I don't remember who exactly, uh, I, I'm, I'm very bad at names, memory, so okay. I, I can't give you a name, but I'm sure if you type on the internet okay. 21 days, I'm sure you'll find some references. I think the main point mm. to me, yeah. uh, to be very practical beyond the, the maybe the, the science behind, is just to understand that I think creating those habits takes time, takes repetition. That's the first thing. And it takes not like just uh, three days or four days. It takes, I would say, at least a month where you actually repeat an action. But the second thing also, which I didn't mention is, or I mentioned earlier in another room is, we remember 90% of what we experience and maybe 10% of what we read or hear with our um, ears. So the point being, if you repeat an experience right an experience for at least 20 days or a month that experience or the effect will become automatic in your body so for instance if i go on a talk uh, every day during a month or every day during two months the fear that i have or the ability to slow down my heart although it's hard to it's going to become automatic my heart is going to automatically slow down as I enter the room, I will not have to make an extra effort. Uh, driving a car, same. Yeah. 21 days driving, it becomes taking that, f that role of facilitator in a meeting. Tomorrow, you have a team, you have a company, try taking that role. Try asking the team, let's set three norms. We listen to each other, we express ourselves automatically. It will take you probably a month repeating that about every day so that you have no more fear or you feel totally comfortable asking for those norms. That's what I mean by uh, creating, I don't know, uh, does yeah, it yeah, help thank you. a little you bit? Answered. Yes. Connections are stronger because you have been practicing it. Exactly. exactly. Thank you. And that time, to be more specific, it's the time to create neuronal connection. You need electrical current between two synapses, but also you need that chemical interaction with the neurotransmitters. That takes time to be totally uh, put together. Yes, o over there. Yeah, one more question. Yes, sir. Thank you, David. I'll make yeah. you run. <laughs> no, <it's good> <laughs> Thank you. Um, when you spoke about sharing roles, you said it should be the same if it is on a di digital interface or in presential. Don't you think that in digital there could be some uh, perhaps o overplaying sometimes having a certain role because you don't have the real personal touch between people that so someone for example will play another role because there's some virtuality oh i see what you mean yeah, yeah. uh no i understand your point but uh, maybe um th th what i'm no i was trying to say is just um this could apply to physical sense as well uh, sharing roles means Everyone attends the meeting in any case, and anyone participates, everyone has the same implication on that level. It's just that you add another layer to it, saying some people will also, at the end of the meeting, share how they felt. Someone will be more, um, for instance, the, uh, uh, the person um, uh, making sure we respect the norms and raising a hand when norms are not respected. I will take the uh, role of facilitator, meaning I will ask questions and not give answers. I will help the group uh, communicate. 
So in that sense, it's not uh, you change your personality or you become someone else. That's not that's not what we're talking about. Taking a role doesn't mean I'm not. I'm, uh, here is Artus, and now I take another personality. I'm still Artus, but on top of being myself during this meeting, I also during this meeting, my role for the meeting is to be facilitator or to be observer on top of participate. Does that make sense? Yes, but my question is due to the, the virtual interface, yes. can people change personality because of the distance and because of the, yeah. My experience is no, that doesn't make a difference. And actually the more you set the norms and share roles, the more people feel safe and so the more connected they feel to people, although they are not in physical presence, and so the less you have this effect. It's actually very powerful to help the group be um, very creative uh, and efficient, having especially when you are distanced because you don't have the physical interaction. And more confident, I suppose. Yes, so I would actually suggest that those roles are even more important when you are distanced than in person. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you so much, Osha. That was a wonderful Thanks. presentation.